Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Hey, do you have an idea for a podcast but don't know where to start? Or do you have an already existing podcast that you want to take to the next level? Well, check out WeKnowPodcasting.com. From concept development to theme music to editing to logos, WeKnowPodcasting.com is a one-stop shop for all things pod. Don't hesitate to hit us up. We're very nice. We're here to entertain you. We'll sing your songs for good times, the best times, you can't go wrong. We'll two-step, a new step, it won't be long. When the Dixieland is up playing, soon you'll be swaying, so come on, sing along. all you beautiful people and welcome to 2022 that's right we are officially in the future but that's not going to stop us from talking about the past i am your host gelsey laurie and today we are joined by a beautiful guest tessa markle who is an actress and the host of podcast fem regard and we are talking about the history of dueling let's just duel right in i challenge you to a duel <gasps> <laughs> I accept. Okay, Tessa, first of all, thank you for being on today. Absolutely. I'm super excited about this one. So you are going to talk about the history of dueling. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know where to begin. First, when Matt was like, she wants to do the history of dueling, I had like a mini dance party in my kitchen. I was like, <laughs> that is the bombest, like awesomest topic I think we've had presented. I was like, hell yeah, absolutely. <laughs> where, like, how did you even pick this? You know, when I heard about your show, I was like, oh, that's such a fun concept and try to think to myself, like, what would I even choose? There's so many things, you know, mm-hmm. and I always have said like, oh, I was born in the wrong decade or century or whatever, you know, but that was kind of just the first one that came to mind. And personally, I'm actually taking sword fighting lessons right now. Epic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it epic. really even made kind of extra sense for me for that. But I've always really been into like period piece movies mm-hmm. and like the Renaissance and pirates and like all that stuff, even Western. So like, you know, they all dueled. <laughs> they do all West- duel. And that's why I'm excited to go in because I was explaining it to my mom actually. She's like, oh, what are you talking about? I was like, dueling. She's like, like back to back, walk five paces, turn and shoot. And I was like, but dueling goes back before that to swords, yeah. it's like before guns even existed. So I'm really excited to see where it started. And in that case, where did, when did dueling begin? So it was the most popular in the 17th and 18th century when it was still a lot of times with swords. But I mean, Mm -hmm. it dates dates back to like the 1200s, really, you know, over time, it obviously they had more rules and it got more formal and everything like that. But like, even from the very beginning, it it was all about your honor, right? You know, like Mm -hmm. it wasn't just, oh, we're having a fight. It was you dishonored me, so you have to now be a gentleman, and that's how we're going to fight this out, you know? Did they slap each other with a glove? Yeah, uh, that was one of the ways you yes. could do it. That's always what I think of, like, I challenge you to a duel, slap on the face. I was like, it's not official until you slap them on the face with a glove. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I do. I love how it is such an honorable thing, because now it's like you could almost take a duel to, well, I think there's two modern day duels. I think there's the bar fight, Mm -hmm. And it's so not formal and not honorable. (laughs) Mostly everyone that gets into a bar fight is a schmuck and they're drunk. And you're like, God, you are a failure of a person. Sorry if you're really cool and have gotten to a bar fight, by the way, listening to this. (laughs) Everyone's allowed one. (laughs) And then I feel like our modern day duels are like via Twitter now. It's a duel with our words. And it's, again, 
it's not always the most honorable thing. And again, if you're a fighter on Twitter and you're cool, I'm not talking about you. But <laughs> yeah, it is. I love that sense of honor. And so was it seen? Where did the honor come from? Was it like, oh, if you're a higher class, higher educated person in society, then you would have the formal education of fighting and pistols and sword fighting? I mean, does that come into play or? It's somewhat. I mean, it. so it usually was only with like higher ranking or people higher in society. Um, mm-hmm. And you definitely had to at least be at the same level. Like somebody that's a nobleman challenging like a knight was unheard of. Like that was just embarrassing for both parties. Okay. So yeah, so it was always like had to be matched and it was usually the higher nobleman throughout time really until like maybe like Western era when it really was like, you know, they're out on the wild west. The wild west, around yeah. The jewels, yeah so. <laughs> Rules don't apply. Yeah. <laughs> Love the west. Rules don't apply. Interesting. Yeah. So you said it started getting popular in the 17th and 18th century. Yeah, that's when it that's most of the stories that I was finding of like significant duels and when they were like making more rules and making it more formal and like they had wrote an actual like code of conduct kind of thing was all during that time period. Okay, so that's the first time we see an actually written code of conduct with duels. Well, I guess there's been several throughout history, really, but that seemed to be the time when it was more across the world, kind of a unified, like, this is how it's done sort of thing, because it was popularized all over the world and everybody kind of had their own rules with it or their own traditions with it and stuff like that. So got more unified, at least then. Okay, interesting. So was that more than at that point, our traditional guns, pistols duel, or was sword dueling still quite popular then? In the late 18th century in England is really where pistols started to become more popular than swords, but they kind of both were coexisting through the 19th century, really. And again, it depended on, you know, where it was, what was more popular, if it was, you know, noblemen in France that are trained to fence anyway, like it made more sense for them to stick to a rapier sword. So that was kind of when the shift was. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And most, I mean, all duels are duels to the death. No, surprisingly, I learned this too. Um, Because I thought the same thing, you know, but again, it depended on where you were, the code of conduct there, but it's actually a lot less common for it to be a duel to the death. Well, that's nice to know. There were a number of different conclusions that could be drawn. So one of them was to first blood, which was just, you know, as soon as they saw blood, they stopped. One was until one man was so severely wounded that they just couldn't continue, but not dead, not mortally wounded. I feel like at that time in history, if you're that wounded, you probably are going to die. Like I mean, the way medicine was, I was like, oh, <laughs> maybe not then, but like next week, you're not going to make it. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> and then, of course, there was to the death. Mm-hmm. There was also in the case of pistol duels where each party would fire one shot. If neither man was hit and the challenger stated that he was satisfied, the duel could be declared over. Again, it just all depended on as long as things were agreed upon, even if it like kind of wasn't following the code of conduct, as long as like all parties agreed, that was the big thing. Because of course, like, again, I it was just cheated honor. death. Yeah. They're like, nope, I'm good. I didn't yeah. get shot. Let's just call it. Yeah. <laughs> you barely brushed by my pants. I'm good. This is, yeah. this was stupid. Yeah. Which actually oh, was another thing too, because, you know, whenever someone would challenge someone to a duel, they usually, each party had a second, they were called, or a friend. Mm-hmm. And that person was like kind of the mediator. So the two seconds would get together and see if they could just come to an agreement, get somebody to apologize, to call off the duel before it even happened. So that was a common thing, too, which to me almost sounds like less honorable in the way that, you know, men operated back then. It's like getting a friend to go talk to the guy at the bar instead of just getting the balls to go talk to him yourself. You're like, hey, exactly. you friend over there? <laughs> exactly. Like duels. <laughs> Interesting. So was there ever stories? I want to obviously get into some of the stories you have, but the seconds, would they ever, I mean, that sounds like with testosterone and, and men all there to fight, it sounds yeah. like that would just be more people that are going to be like, now I duel you or like there had to be situations where the seconds get into a fight or come in and. You know, I haven't seen any stories of that specifically, but a lot of duels like it would so most of the time they were illegal throughout history, but just nobody really cared. Nobody punished anybody for it. So a lot of times they could kind of become like a whole affair that like not only the seconds would be there, but like there'd be a small audience and stuff. So you mm-hmm. might have a lot of people rooting for one side or the other, and they I'm sure they got into arguments and stuff like that. 
but I haven't seen any specific stories of like a full second duel breaking out because of it. <laughs> but I could imagine it probably happened. <laughs> I, I guess I'm just putting duels in today's society back to yeah. the bar fights. I was like, there's no way you can get people together and just not break out into a fight. But they had <laughs> honor then. Oh, yeah. I want to know the rules of a duel. Mm -hmm. And I know that it sounds like they've changed a lot, but kind of give me the basic guidelines of like, what does a duel look like? In a traditional situation, after a perceived offense, quote unquote, whether real or imagined, um, one party would demand satisfaction from the offender and they would signal this demand with an inescapably insulting gesture is the wording. I love that. Slapping their face with a glove. Exactly. That's the example (laughs) they give. (laughs) So once the challenge was accepted, both parties would have to appoint their seconds and no further communication between the two actual duelers at that time until the duel. So Mm. all the rest of the communication between then and like the next morning or whenever it was going to take place would just be between the the seconds to see if they could call it off. Also, the job of the seconds to make all of the arrangements in advance. So like how long the duel would last or any conditions if it was like you know, they have to be this many paces apart, or this is the specific weapon that they both have to use. Because that was another thing is they always had to have the same weapon, which, you know, everybody at that time had their own personal weapons. So I'm sure they mm-hmm. weren't always exactly matched, but they couldn't have, you know, a pistol against a sword or something. Right. Like that. Yeah, that's not. So that's just decided between the second, how many paces these were all just depending duel per duel changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they didn't have the awesome song from Hamilton to like play it and be like, here we go. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some kind of music or entertainment. It, it it's sounds exactly like, it was like the whole that, right? Show. Like, yeah. Well, hip hop duel song. They're like, okay, I got it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it, the uh, mode where the two duelists would stand back to back and walked away from each other for a set of paces, which is kind of what we all know as the traditional mm-hmm. duel, was actually called the French method. Hmm. So apparently started in France. Another method required the duelist to stand still at an agreed distance and fire simultaneously on a signal. And this was the type of duel favored in Britain. So same idea, except they just didn't walk, you know, back to back away from each other. They just started somewhere and it was like one, two, three, shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Another variant required the duelist to take turns to shoot with a challenger, challenger shooting first or the right of the first shot being decided by a coin toss. So that sounds terrifying because what? you don't You're even get in there. You're like, I know he's going to shoot first. Exactly. Fuck my life. <laughs> don't hit me. God, no. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, you know, the rules, it sounds like we're more kind of region to region. And then over time, everybody kind of accepted the general things that everybody liked. But really, it just broke down to like, what can those two parties agree on? And as long as everybody agrees, that's the rules for that duel. Okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. But between so say there's a gun duel, they've got pistols and then they've got swords. How are the differences? I mean, obviously you're not going to like walk back to back, s- separate and then draw mm-hmm. your swords and then like come back to each other you're like, "Uh, Hungar, like this is weird." <laughs> so, were there any differences as far as some of the guidelines and rules if a sword or saber was used? Yeah. And again, it depended on the region Mm because there were so many different styles of sword fighting. Like, for instance, what we more know as like classical fencing that has like the long skinny things that was kind of based on the rapier, which is um, like an Italian and a French style. So that's a lot more like formal, you know, the other hands behind the back and they're making sure that they're this distance apart. And it's very, Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, and it's like choreographed almost, you know, that's the best way I can put it is. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But then you have like the Germans, for instance, and they would do the Kampf or Konfekten, which was their style. And that was more like the German long sword. And that's the sword fighting that I study personally. So it is cool. also very like specific moves and choreographed kind of deal. But at the same time, it looks way more messy. You know what I mean? It okay. Looks yeah. Violent, it looks more. So that would kind of be the difference to like you know, us untrained people watching a duel or something like Mm -hmm. that. But it was all, again, agreed upon things like for sword fighting, for instance, the whole idea is that there's like this pitch, it's called in the middle, which is just a space between you. And it's essentially a circle. So the idea is that both of you are going around this circle the same distance apart the entire time until you come in for, you know, a move, a kill, whatever it is. So in that way, it, it is similar to the pistol duel where you had to be a certain amount of paces apart. Mm-hmm. So oh, that makes all sense. about yeah. keeping it there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? <laughs> 
duels are fair. <laughs> it's interesting. It would make sense that there's so many different styles via the world. I mean, that's, I grew up as a dancer. And so you just look at even, I grew up in very strict ballet mm-hmm. and ballet is probably one of the most universal styles of dance as far as language. Cause it's all used in the French language and it's, I can go anywhere in the world, take a ballet class and yeah. pretty much understand what we're going to do. But there's still different styles, be it Royal ballet, Russian style. It's just technique. Um, and again, style are very different because it's just you lose that with distance. Everyone kind of comes up with their own translation. So it definitely makes sense. And then it was interesting even talking about the different sword styles you were mentioning in this that it, it brought me to the last podcast that um, we released was on pirates. And I love mm-hmm. pirate history. I think it's so interesting. But it kind of makes you think of that when you think of pirate fighting. I was like, oh, yeah, you see pirates kind of more. Ha-ha, hmm. But yeah. then you also see them a lot more gritty, like just tearing it up. That's a perfect example of how it all kind of came together. Because Mm -hmm. if you know pirate history, if you don't, you know, obviously crews are made more internationally, depending on what pirate, what their crew was, where they were sailing, they kind of gathered everyone from around the world in different situations. And so you see that style of fighting kind of collaborate. And it's, yeah, it's interesting too, with the duels. Okay, so tell me one of your favorite dueling stories. Probably the most famous one is Alexander Hamilton, at least, you know, in our part of the world. We I know that like whole story. Hamilton. Okay, I'll <laughs> exactly. Stop. Hamilton was great. You know what? I was one of those people that waited forever to watch it because everyone was so into it. And my dad was so into it. And the first 20 minutes, I kind of was like, arms crossed. Like, I mean, I guess, but whatever. And then all of a sudden, it was like the 21st minute, whatever. All of a sudden, I was like, God damn it, this is good. <laughs> I was like, shit, (laughs) everyone was right. This is awesome. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, that's probably the most famous Mm -hmm. one of like our Western history, Um, which actually, you know, I was looking a little more into that just to refresh my memory on the situation. Several of our past U.S. presidents were involved in duels and they ended up just being like, you know, either they talked them down from it or it was like a, you know, first shot. Okay, we're done. Nobody's injured. Let's go home. So like none of them were as notable and stuff. But mm-hmm. I just thought that was interesting. It listed a few of them, like even Lincoln, what he ended up not actually following through with the duel. But like, who knew? <laughs> so many of my them first guess. Involved. I was like, Lincoln, he seems like he'd get himself mixed up in a duel. <laughs> that tall hat. I don't totally, know he's up totally. to those shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, other than that, like, there's not specific people's stories that I found, but mm-hmm. there's examples of different kinds of duels that I thought were fun. Like, for one, it was called the chivalric pas de arms. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you say it, pas d'arms. Convince me. <laughs> yeah, fr- French, I guess. Looks French to me. Um, but it evolved in the late 14th century and remained popular through the 15th century where a knight or group of knights would stake out a traveled spot, such as a bridge or city gate, and let it be known that any other knight who wished to pass must first fight or be disgraced. So instead of like a one-on-one duel, it was like, if you're going to cross my bridge, we've got to fight or you're just a disgrace. If the travelers didn't have weapons or a horse to meet the challenge, one would be provided. So they had no choice. And if they did choose not to fight, they would have to leave their spurs behind as a side of humiliation. And then lastly, if a lady passed unescorted, she would have to leave behind a glove or a scarf. So back to the glove. Um, (laughs) But it would have to she would leave it behind and it would be rescued and returned to her by a future knight who passed through. So I thought that was a cool kind of. It almost like sounds fake, like it was, you know, made up for a story or something. But Yeah. Interesting. It's funny. I feel like I'm okay. I'm such a big Mel Mel Brooks fan. Yeah. And it's so much of this specifically Robin Hood Men and Tights is what mm-hmm. I my the first movie I grew up with. And so much of this is just taking me to that movie. Yeah. Anyways, that's a tangent, but very interesting. It's funny as you were talking, I just remembered um I go to New Orleans a lot. It's my mm-hmm. favorite city in the US. Oh, I love it too. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I miss it so bad. I haven't been since before the pandemic, but their duels used to be legal in New Orleans. And so there was there's a spot behind the St. Louis Cathedral. Mm-hmm. Behind it is where they would duel famously. And there's actually If you're behind the cathedral looking at it to your left, there's a hotel there. I can't remember the hotel's name, but it's the most haunted hotel, if not location in the quarter, I think. Okay. And I know a lot of people there would break out into brawls or whatever and and challenge each other to duels. And they would always go right behind the cathedral. And supposedly it's a very haunted ground right specifically there from all the people that died dueling. 
Mm. Probably left out some details. It was on one of those haunted tours as a couple hurricanes in. But <laughs> that's basically the gist. So when did duels kind of fade out in history? So at least here on the Western side of the world, Mm -hmm. it was kind of after the Civil War, not just in America, but even like also Europe, Britain, just that kind of happened to be the time when it started to fade out. And a lot of places, like it was kind of generally outlawed, but not necessarily like in writing as a formal law. So Mm -hmm. most places just didn't care, like even where it was considered murder, if you killed the other person in a duel, they would kind of look the other way. That sort of deal. Oh my so, gosh, that's are, like the perfect way to get away with murder. Be like, you killed oh, yeah. him. It was a duel. Oh, oh, yeah. you're fine. You're fine. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There are even some places that like, if you just denied a duel, that was considered like so rude that you could like essentially sue that person, you know, so you oh, could wow. take legal okay. action against them for <laughs> saying, no, I don't want a duel. Yeah. It just depended where it was it's super accepted. But around the time of right after the Civil War is when a lot of places started writing formal laws against it. But even then, I mean, so in America, it looks like 1839 was when they proposed a constitutional amendment to to outlaw dueling. Didn't quite go through at that time, but shortly after. But even after it being like an official law across the country, individual states had to have their own laws because again, still people didn't really listen. People would look the other way. So even like into like 70s, 80s, 90s, depending on the state, there were laws what? specifically about duels. Yeah, it was what? like, you know, you couldn't run for governor of Iowa or whatever if you had participated in a duel and stuff like that. That yeah, Were you would people think still was, dueling in the 70s? There was at least the laws, so maybe. Oh my gosh, just <laughs> casually like at the disco to the Bee Gees and they're like, yeah. I said, did you look at my girl? <laughs> that's how they talk in states that still allowed dueling in the 70s. Of course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> they were proper. They obviously had a lot of honor in those states. We were just unaware. <laughs> kind of a side note, but I have you ever looked up laws that exist in the US, like state by state? Like there's- Yes, all the weird ones. That my friend had, yeah, that were like the most obscure laws. And it's like, you cannot hold a cat on Saturday while holding a <laughs> can of Coke and- saying the alphabet or like, like yeah. that's obviously ridiculous but there it gets to that ridiculous point when you're like why is this a law a someone had to do this thing it pissed someone off and why are we taking our time and energy to make that law to, like, exactly it's so crazy yeah <laughs> interesting yeah this is so fun so why did you start taking sword fighting aside it being badass i mean yeah <laughs> but so i'm an actor okay. um and like i said i love period pieces so like mm-hmm. my dream would be to be in like a renaissance film or a pirate mm-hmm. film or you know oh, my goal but all of my favorite time periods are like dueling time periods mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know obviously being a woman i may or may not ever have to pick up a weapon in a movie like that but I wanted Unless to be ready Gina for it. Davis and Cutthroat Island, which this is true. <laughs> I'm going to just keep mentioning her from now on in my podcasts. <laughs> I mean, she deserves it. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I wanted to be ready. I wanted to have that skill so that I had a better likelihood of being able to do that. So I went into it first doing rapier Italian style, which is more mm-hmm. like the classical fencing. Um, but that was before the pandemic. So after lockdown, the class didn't really exist anymore. So then I found out about this German longsword school, which they also teach a lot of other weapons, but that's kind of how you start regardless. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't care what style, what sword, like, I just want to do it. So (laughs) let's go. (laughs) So I've been doing it for about five or six months now. And it's, it's difficult, but it's fun. I I'm definitely sticking with it for a while. I'm enjoying it. Oh, that's a bit. Fencing has always been on my list of things I want to do. I should just start because I, I don't technically say I'm an actor. I'm an entertainer because I mm-hmm. kind of bounce around from every avenue, but it is something that you never know when it's going to, I kind of love being in the entertainment business for that reason, where I feel like I can just find something and be like, well, I'm just going to learn this skill because you never know. But it, you can also kind of find things you've always wanted to, but you're like, yeah. it's for my career. Yeah, it is. But it's also like, yes, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, fencing. I've always I feel like I have always wanted to fence since I was a kid. Well, I did love watching pirate movies as a kid growing up and, and adventure films. But when Parent Trap with Lindsay Lohm came out, yeah. I was that impressionable age when they have like the full fencing fight. And I was like, <laughs> I need to learn to do this. What if I go to summer camp and meet my long lost twin and we have to like prove ourselves? Exactly. <laughs> Hello. But then actually... I, then as I gotten older, I really, really want to learn it. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Awesome. And I mean, you know, with sword fighting specifically too, there's, 
especially in LA where there's, there is like multiple schools for it. You know, you can learn the actual official way to sword fight, or you can learn the theatrical version, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, same style, but obviously they teach you a little bit differently. So you can adapt one to the other, but you know, one's meant for screen and, you know, stage and whatever, but totally funny enough, relating that back to just dueling in general, dueling also kind of became a sport after a while, after it was not really as widely accepted as a form of like, let's settle our differences. It was still popular enough that people kind of wanted it to keep going. So they would like stage duels. So yeah, it kind of became I guess it's kind of like how we have fights now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we literally, I mean, what, that's probably one of the highest paid ticket sport and what's the direct TV pay-per-view for a fight. It's stupid. But yeah, I feel like that culture hasn't died. Right. At one point, and I couldn't find exactly when this was, but dueling as a sport was even in the Olympics, but you couldn't get a medal for it. So I don't, this must've been early on because I think everything in the Olympics is medal, right? Like you don't, I don't think there's just a for funsies Olympic. Like, yeah. So I think it must've um, been like in the beginning of the Olympics. I think fencing is, fencing is still in the Olympics. Fencing is. Yeah. Yeah. Which but it was like dueling of, specifically. So I don't know how that really worked interesting. as a sport exactly. But yeah, they're like, you win. Do I no medal? Just that was <laughs> you were the in-between act between anyways, let's go to tennis. Like yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be so bummed if I won in the Olympics in a sport and, and didn't, get, didn't a medal? get a medal. Yeah. Like, can I get something? Like <laughs> a plaque? Nothing. Okay, whatever. Well, is there anything that we have not touched upon dueling that you're like, oh, there was this note I wrote that's so cool? Or well, there was one other um, version that I just found really entertaining when I was reading. Mm-hmm. So this was this goes back to like how it varied bit by bit in different regions and stuff. So the Ionian Islands, which is Greece essentially, um, in the 19th century, there was a practice of formalized fighting between men over points of honor. So knives were the weapons that were used in such fights, and they would begin with an exchange of specifically sexually related insults in a public place, such as a tavern, and then the men would fight with the intention of slashing the other's face rather than killing. Oh, they're trying to, like, deform them and, like, get this yeah. scar. So, like, that's really, you know, the bar fight, <laughs> like you were saying earlier. That is a bar fight. <laughs> yeah. And most things that are going to be said in a bar that are offensive or, yeah, hmm, interesting. <laughs> How mean. I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to yeah. scar your face. Yeah, I'm just going to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> we should bring it back. I mean, hey, I feel like if you get into a fight that you just can't settle, it just makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is. I love the whole, like, don't be drunk bar fighting it out. That No, like, you've had to put in some hours and training yeah to win this now and i think that we should result in twitter fights to duels yeah now people need to put in their hours yeah (laughs) behind their saber like and i think we should leave it to swords and sabers like let's leave guns out of it let's it's like we don't need that fair right not to death just a little scratch a little blood you win and then there you go you you should have not been out at the bar or on Twitter as much as in the gym, practicing your form. Exactly. And that was another reason a lot of duels happened to Dawn because they wanted to give everybody time to sober up because everybody was constantly drunk in the past many centuries. (laughs) Which I feel like you had to, to get through those times. Exactly. You're like, wow, we all die at 40 because everything kills us. (laughs) And (laughs) this is awful. Let's drink. Do you have any exciting plans for 2022 or like your big, like, this is my goal this year? I don't even, my goals, I tried to write them and I was like, I don't know. It's so weird. (laughs) Yeah. um, I mean, I, so I don't do resolutions anymore. I think Mm -hmm. it's just kind of ridiculous to plan something for the entire year that you're going to change about your life, drastic, like whatever. But my biggest goal this year is me and my production partner, Carolina, are going to make our first feature film. So yeah, right now we're just looking for funding. Everything else is ready. So we're hoping to start filming by the summertime, but really anytime this year, we'd be happy to start. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. I love that. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I agree with resolutions. It's kind of, I also, I read something once years ago that was like, why wait until January 1st to try to start new habits and goals and lifestyle changes. And I was like, that is so true. Like, I feel like we just kind of put, oh, in the new year. So I try to implement like, you know, just readjust every couple months, be like, mm-hmm. okay, how are things going? What? And you never know what life's going to throw at you. I've had some major curves in my road that I didn't expect and they can yeah. completely deter you. And then you just get depressed when you're really off kilter and you're like, Ugh. so I like that <laughs> flexibility. But I also, yeah, love having a, a project 
Yeah. So it's exciting. All right. Well, I think that's what we got on dueling. Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This was super fun. It was so fun. Yeah. Please come back. I would love to have you again and let's talk about all the other million things that happened before (laughs) we were born. Shamelessly plug yourself. Where can we find you? Sure. Um, So I also have a podcast. It's called Femme Regard Podcast. I co-host. We're on all the major platforms and including Geekscape. And it's all about indie filmmaking. Everything from, you know, we have directors and producers on to entertainment lawyers and music supervisors. So everything in the film industry. You can follow us for Femme Regard across all platforms at Femme Regard, at Femme underscore Regard on Twitter, because that one was already taken. (laughs) Our website's just FemmeRegard.com. And then me personally, I'm Miss Tessa Lauren across all the social media platforms. Yeah, thanks so much. Looking forward to following you. Thank you. All right. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. All right, Kelsey, I've got two things that I want to talk about after your conversation with Tessa. Mm -hmm. And I'll start with one of these days we're going to get to Mel Brooks. But since Robin Hood Men in Tights is during our time, uh, can we just talk about how great that movie is? Oh, my God. It literally, you know, I always try to think what's my favorite Mel Brooks movie. And I have to. I don't necessarily know if that is my absolute favorite, but I always have to say it is because that was my first and it's the one we had on VHS that I watched the most as a kid. So it just like it really made me who I am today. It's such a good, quotable, fun oh, movie. So good. I think my sister and I quote Blinken the most. Like there's the scene where Blinken and Robin are reunited it has like one of the best back and forth in like any Mel Brooks movie. Oh, let's just start from like you lost your arms in battle. Oh. But you grew some nice boobs. <laughs> Love this. Like, yeah. But the back, my goldfish Goldie? Eaten by the cat. My cat? Choked on the goldfish. Like, <laughs> it's such a, it's so great. Oh, it's good to be home. No. It's, it's such a good movie. There's not it one is a line really that, good movie. that falls. Yeah. Okay. So the second thing, now that we've gotten the quoting Robin Hood Men in Tights all the way, that was how me. are we? So the second thing is how am I pulling the Muppets into this? Well, let me tell you, Matt. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> okay, the whole forward. time I was recording when I was like, hmm, ha ha, ha <laughs> is in Muppet Treasure Island when Captain Smollett, <laughs> who's Kermit, is fighting Tim Curry as Long John Silver. And he's like, why don't you pick on someone your own side? and he's just like constantly like and like un- like ripping off all his lace and buttons it's all I was thinking about and I was like Kelsey don't talk about the Muppets right now Tess has given you awesome history and that's like literally all I was thinking about that's what the outros are for the outros are for us getting our My geeky Muppet, Muppets reference in Muppet rant. I was like, oh, it's this is okay. Anyway, sorry, your second. No, second my second thing. thing is you asked Tessa what her New Year's resolution was. If we if you or I actually believed in New Year's resolutions, what would yours have been? You know, literally yesterday, I've actually got my journal. I'm a big journaler. And I was doing this whole like end of year recap. I found this website that was like 10 questions to ask and blah, blah, blah. And finally, the last one was like, what are your intentions and goals for 2022? And I it really took me a long time. I kind of stressed out a bit. Obviously the last year, two years, we've all had a wrench in our plans thrown with COVID and it threw me in a new direction. And then last year with my really bad concussion, it's pulled me off of a path completely that I've just put all, all my eggs into that basket being stunts. And I'm definitely kind of in this very lost, like, oh my gosh, what am I doing right now? But I think I clearly in the back of my head know exactly where I'm going. And I'm an entertainer. I'm always going to be an entertainer. So my goal this year is to get an agent. I think I've been pussyfooting around because part of me is like, I'm scared and do it, you know, but I'm like, Kelsey, you know, you want to do this. So get an agent Um, and health. My health was kind of my number one thing I wrote and, and dove into first. I've, you know, obviously we all are focusing right now on health with COVID going around, but after getting my concussions and I just, I constantly seem like every four to six weeks, I'm a little run down. I'm a little sick. And I'm sick of it. I'm done not being 100% and feeling great. So that's my main goal is just to get myself to a place where I'm not running myself into the ground. I'm actually taking rest days, which I'm really bad at, and listening to my body and and making sure I get that. So that's my biggest goal. And then, yeah, an agent and, you know, entertaining and booking. and But, yeah, anyways, what's what's yours? Uh, similar to yours where it's like kind of a two-fold it thing. Um, and one of them I've already started, which is great. But uh, I wanted to get back into going to therapy because I kind of put that on on the sidelines for about three years. Uh, So I had my first therapy session yesterday. So it was very exciting, very nice. 
And even before going to the therapy session, I knew that this was the other resolution I want to make for myself. But then after the therapy session, it became all the more apparent that it's a necessary change Mm -hmm. is trying to at least set aside one day out of the week where I'm not doing work. Yeah, you got to have you got to have free days and play days. I really am a huge advocate for that. And I know it's kind of funny. We we almost have like a very similar resolution and making sure we rest and take a day off because yeah. you and I are both workhorses and, and we relate on that. I've also had a lot of things happen and, and lost some friends this year and, and also be it what it is. This is our life right now. Like it's, yeah. you know, to work hard now to play later. I, I believe in that a bit. You got to save your nuts for the winter, but you might not make it to the winter or you're, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so once I kind of really sat down and was like, okay, definitely put the work in, but you need to enjoy now also because life is now. And so it's like, what's the point of of shutting yourself into a box and just working hard when you're going to wake up one day and go, God, 10 years ago, what just happened? Like, And I always think of my friend Andrew from the Roaring Twenties podcast once said to me, hey, the good news is that our generation is probably not going to have the leisure of being able to retire. So like if you're (laughs) going to have to work until the day you die, pace it out and have as much fun as you can during those like young, fresh years. <laughs> I, and I, I don't Oh God, that's so depressing, but I don't it's even see myself. perspective. I don't think I I'll see ever myself stop working. Down. No, you know, I, agree. I think I'll be like a, like, and I just want to throw out a quick RIP Betty White. Oh, for sure. I, none of us can say enough words, but at the same time, I'm also like, okay, you know, she was 99. I hope I live that long. And she inspires me of someone that lived her best life until she died at 99 and didn't go, well, I'm old, I'm 80 now, it's time to sit at home and do nothing or I can't, you know, but she kept working, kept busy, kept her social life. And I think that's what kept her alive and young for so long. And and she's such an inspiration. I really didn't even start living her best life until her 50s and 60s. You know what I mean? Like, not that she wasn't always a working established actress, but like, the Betty White pre Golden Girls has nothing on the Betty White oh, post no. Gilmore or Gilmore Girls okay. Golden Girls. <laughs> so like, yeah, I, I think that those are always inspiring stories too because I know that I'm getting to that point where I'm like, all right, I'm past the the midway point of my 30s. Like, and you have this thing in your head where it's like, well, if you haven't made it by 40, you're not going to make it at all. But then there's nah, tons I don't of examples that. of that's not the truth. Yeah, like, you can look at so many actors that like didn't make their break until their 40s and they're like like Morgan Freeman or so. I, yeah. I, I forget how old he was when he but like and there's so many CEOs that didn't yeah. get, you know, into their jam until their 40s and even 50s. So I think that's an old school American dream. Yeah, mentality no, for sure. That age. Now, if someone's like in their thirties and sitting on their couch smoking pot every day, then I'm like, you are not going to make it. But, yeah, you got to make, but I'd like, like to believe that you and I have the work ethic that eventually pays off, right? <laughs> anybody listening to this podcast has, uh, wants to give us the connections and sees that we are two hardworking, very passionate, genuine people. Yeah. Help us yeah. out here. No. Yeah. Grinding <laughs> you all are helping nonstop. us out by listening. Yeah, you... no, we appreciate you all. And you know what? If they really want to help us, where can they tell people to go to check us out? <laughs> they can tell us, uh, tell us, we know. Tell people to go to Instagram or go themselves to Instagram and search at before my time underscore podcast. Also on Facebook, search before my time. We will pop up there. You can join the community of other like-minded people who love things that happened before their time. Share your thoughts on past episodes. Show out some ideas for future episodes, or just share a picture of like a really cool couch from the fifties. We're here for it. Um, You can find our podcast at any major podcasting platforms, but obviously you found this one, so (laughs) no need for that. Leave us a five-star review, though. Show us some love, man. That really helps. Five stars is a good way to start 2022. So that's my that's my goal this year is to get more five star reviews on this podcast. There you go. And we will be back next week with even more before my time. Love you all. Bye.
You're listening to the Geekscape Network. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.